Good afternoon from Nashville. I'd like to thank the program committee for the opportunity to give this presentation on elective surgery and quality of life. What really matters to our patients? I have no disclosures. So I'm gonna talk about a couple things today. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the dilemma, the clinical dilemma that we face in our clinic. Second, I'm gonna talk about what the guidelines tell us. Then I'm gonna talk about what the data tells us. I'm gonna tell us what our patients tell us. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I do it in my practice. And then finally, I'm gonna wrap things up with some conclusions at the end of this talk. So first, the dilemma. Here you are in clinic, it's your third patient of the day. You have a very nice woman come in and she tells you that she has had four prior episodes of diverticulitis and she needs to know whether she needs her colon out. To which my general reply is, hmm. So anytime there's some clinical equipoise, I like to look at my society's guidelines. And for colon and rectal surgery, it's the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgery. And here I'm gonna show you how the question of surgery for recurrent diverticulitis has changed over the past couple of years. In 1995, the consensus statement from the ASCRS said that elective resection should be considered after two well-documented attacks of diverticulitis, depending on age. In 2000, this changed to after two attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis, resection is commonly recommended. Resection may be recommended for patients with complicated diverticulitis after a single attack. Six years later, the number of attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis is not necessarily an overriding factor in defining the appropriateness of surgery. Because of the younger lifespan, I'm sorry, longer lifespan, younger patients will have a higher cumulative risk for recurrent diverticulitis. Six years ago, the consensus statement came to the decision to recommend elective sigmoid colectomy after recovery from uncomplicated acute diverticulitis should be individualized. And to that point today, we really are unsure exactly what the right answer is in this question. So let's talk about what we know from the data from recurrent diverticulitis. First, we know that as a patient has more episodes of diverticulitis, their risk of free perforation necessitating emergency laparotomy and potentially an ostomy actually goes down as we see on the graph on the left. In the middle, we see that the likelihood of recurrence is affected not by age at onset, rather by severity of the initial episode. And last on the right, we see a survival curve where patients with an initial episode of diverticulitis progress to the need for emergency laparotomy. We see that that curve is actually fairly low. So the number of patients who need emergency surgery following an episode of diverticulitis is actually quite low. This prompted a 2014 review of the literature to suggest that the data suggests that prophylactic surgery to prevent severe septic complication in asymptomatic patients with a history of diverticulitis is not necessary in most cases. Rather, patients may choose elective operation if the frequency and severity of their episodes is sufficient to justify the burden of surgery. So, if we're not operating for mortality or morbidity in the form of an ostomy, what we then need to think about instead is quality of life. So then we ask the question, what is the effect of surgery on quality of life? This is a study back from 2009 from Italy that looked at 46 consecutive patients with prior diverticulitis. They then underwent laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy, and then they were followed at three, six, and 12 months with a gastrointestinal quality of life index. As seen by the graph on the right, you see that they have fairly low baseline scores that then improve three, six, and 12 months following sigmoid colectomy. This data suggests that for a select group of patients, their quality of life can be improved by sigmoid colectomy. Next, we have a Dutch trial called the DIRECT trial, and they recruited patients with recurrent, which they defined as three or more presentations with clinical signs of acute diverticulitis within two years, or persistent abdominal complaints. These patients were then randomized to surgery versus conservative management, and they're able to enroll 109 patients. As you can see by the table in the middle, they had increase in quality of life scores for patients undergoing surgical treatment as opposed to conservative management, which was effectively no surgery, simply observation in groups including, again, the gastrointestinal quality of life, 
pain, physical, and mental patient reported outcomes measures. This followed up with improvement in the mean quality of life scores up to five years following the surgery. Now, important to note in this study is that 46 patients or 26 patients in the conservative group ultimately required surgery due to severe ongoing abdominal complaints. And the quality of life measure scores of these patients were significantly lower at baseline than patients in the conservative group who did not require surgery. Finally, one of my critiques of this study is that they chose to include patients with persistent abdominal complaints or smoldering diverticulitis, which I see as more of an indication for surgery um, than potential observation. Uh, currently coming down the pipes and in the process of enrolling patients is the COSMIN study or comparison of surgery and medicine on the impact of diverticulitis trial. This is a randomized controlled trial of elective colectomy versus best medical management for quality of life limiting diverticulitis. It attempts to answer the question, should I undergo elective colectomy for diverticulitis or try and avoid an operation by a best medical management with a potentially worse quality of life? Put it another way, is elective colectomy better than best medical management? Again, this study is currently occurring uh, and we probably won't have good data on this for the next couple of years, but just to know that there are ongoing trials to attempt to answer this question. Some of our research is a qualitative study that asks patients what matters to them in the decision to undergo either surgery or observation uh, for recurrent diverticulitis. We performed qualitative methodology and this included a focus groups of five to eight patients that we conducted here at Vanderbilt and also at two other sites. We had two separate groups, one that was contemplating surgery and one that uh, had gone on to undergo surgery. Um, and we, again, uh, had kind of directed focus groups, and I'm going to share with you a couple of the, the quotes from these groups. The first from one of the patients said that they had two fears. One is that it would become an emergency situation, something that would happen with anesthesia, that they couldn't do it and I couldn't have surgery and it would become an emergency situation. And I would have a colostomy, which I do not want. So that was the biggest thing for me. I wanted to go ahead and have it electively so they could control the situation, take care of everything. Again, operating under the previous though, Previous thoughts that a patient was at an increased risk for morbidity and mortality. So ostomy matters to patients and the need for emergent surgery. Second, this gets to speak a little bit at the patients just doesn't know exactly what's going on. I think they're afraid of surgery, but they're also afraid of recurrent diverticular attacks. And finally, another patient spoke to the fact that they didn't want to die from their diverticulitis. And this is a real thing we heard time and time again. Uh, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on surgery, but at the same time, they needed to make a judgment call. Uh, again, short-term pain for a long-term gain. So let's get into a little bit about how I do it. I think there are some easy decisions when you see patients in clinic. The first is if they have a fistula, either colovescal, colovaginal, or colocutaneous, which you sometimes see after percutaneous drainage of an abscess. Second, if they have a stricture that doesn't allow cancer surveillance. Third, immunosuppression. This is usually in the form of pharmacologic immunosuppression, um, steroids or immunomodulating agents for patients who've had a solid organ transplant. Then there's the folks with smoldering or persistent symptoms that just is drastically affecting their quality of life. Finally, um, you need to consider an ostomy in patients who may not be able to be put back together. I think it's important to ask the right questions. How frequent are the attacks? How severe are the attacks? Have they ever been hospitalized? Have they ever had to miss work? Have they ever had to miss family or social obligations? And then I think one of the important things to ask is how much does it bother you? And this really helps you understand. I've operated on patients who've had one episode of diverticulitis and you've told me that it's the worst thing that they've ever experienced and they never want to have it happen again. I've also not operated on patients who've had 10 episodes of diverticulitis and are fine with some intermittent antibiotics once every two or three years. I think it's also important to talk about surgery, so the other side of the coin. You want to talk about, ask their feelings about surgery. What do they think? What are some of their fears? What are their expectations? And I give them my standard sigmoid colectomy talk, how, long, how much time there is in the hospital, what the potential complications are, including an ostomy, and also what they can expect in terms of recovery and return to work. Finally, I asked them, what do they dislike about their current state of health? 
For patients who have comorbidities or may be frail or have other existing potential contraindications to surgery, I think the ASCS NISQIP calculator is also a nice tool to use to help them understand the risk for surgery. Finally, what we're utilizing in our clinics, and uh, there's been a move to do this more and more, is using patient reported outcomes measures. Um, PROMISE is a good battery of tests, as well as the diverticulitis quality of life instrument. These allow you not only to assess the patient where they are at one singular point in time, but track their quality of life over uh, an extended period of time to understand the trajectory, whether they're getting better or whether they're getting worse. Finally, I think it's important that we move toward a shared decision-making model. Um, rather than the, the traditional uh, paternalistic model where the clinician tells the patient what needs to happen, there needs to be more shared decision-making where information goes both ways from the clinician to the patient, where we understand what the patient's values and preferences are, uh, what's important to them. Um, are they missing a lot of work? Are they missing time with their family? Or are they generally okay? And they just have, again, a couple of intermittent episodes of diverticulitis. Finally, a couple points about what to do when you do operate. Um, I think this is one of the most important things. Thaler et al. back in 2003 studied 236 patients and they looked at those who had a recurrence of diverticulitis following surgery. They found that patients who had a colosigmoid anastomosis compared to a colorectal anastomosis had four times the risk of recurrence. That's why I think it's really important to go all the way down to the top of the rectum or the tineus splay when you're doing a resection for diverticulitis. Not associated with recurrence were things like lap versus open, splint flexure mobilization, or even post-operative complications. So in conclusion, I think it's important to know that we operate these days for quality of life in recurrent diverticulitis, not necessarily for mortality or stoma. There's no magic number. So again, the three strikes and you're out rule really hasn't been borne out by data. And it's immensely important to understand the patient perspective on their disease. Thanks very much for your time and attention, and please let me know if you have any questions.